Well, we might as well get started with our uh, chat. All right, so my name's Karen Holiday. I come all the way from Ottawa, Canada, hour and a half on the flight, three hours here from the airport to here, so I'm not sure you know, how that really worked out. But anyway, I'm here and I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I've been in tech for you know 20 odd years, uh, doing a variety of roles. I've done everything from optical planning, uh, QA test, um, you know, automation test, development, marketing, um, and customer care, customer support. So I've kind of done run the gamut, but you know, my love always comes back to QA and uh, you know, just making processes better. Um, so in my personal time, I run uh, races. I like marathons and uh, triathlons, and I like to uh, do anything outside with my family. So. That's me in a nutshell. And probably the most important thing about me today is that I'm the person standing between you and lunch. So uh, we'll try to we'll try to get you to lunch. Um, so you know, throughout my career, I've been uh, asked to come into different companies. Uh, we have a legacy code base. We've got quality problems. You know, we, we're having trouble articulating what those are. You know, our releases are slow. Uh, we, you know, we don't really know what you know what customers are using. We don't really know what's going on with the install base. We don't really know. You know, even what releases our customers are running. Like we, we have a quality problem, and so uh, I've definitely um, been asked to do this at Nortel, Avaya, Halogen, and Saba. So, uh, and currently I work at Ingenious Software, um, and I should probably tell you a little bit about Ingenious Software because some of my references are from there. So, Ingenious Software is a computer telephony integrator. So, we integrate between a Salesforce, a Microsoft, a CRM and a telephony system like a Cisco or an Avaya or a, a web-based uh, system. So we basically make the single pane of glass um, on the CRM that you can control your phone like a remote control uh, from your CRM. So you don't have to have agents and call centers jump around. So if you called your favorite credit card company or, or your favorite travel company, which are customers of ours, they'll give you a really good experience because they know who you are, they'll talk to you, and they'll do some good manipulation within the CRM. So that's, that's where we play, and obviously it's all software-based, um, JavaScript, TypeScript uh, with a .NET backend. So um, throughout, throughout my career, I've, I've been working, it doesn't seem to matter what kind of software, it doesn't matter if it's on-prem, I've worked in SaaS companies. Uh, right now we're even going to a serverless model, which is totally new for me, so there is no, there is no cloud-based system, there's no server. So that's even cooler. So how do I test this stuff, and how do I make sure that my company knows that the actual quality is improving? And I think that's always the biggest hurdle I've had, is I'm doing all these things, and how do I actually show my leadership that yes, I think the product is getting better because there's always a variety of factors. So there's three things I kind of like to, to do when I started an organization and they can all go in parallel. You don't have to do them one at a time and they may go at different speeds. Um, so the first thing is to review everything. So you know, you've got to be data driven when you're in QA. You really have to know what is driving uh, the business and what's driving um, the issues that are coming in. So look at that. Um, and then there's some tactical, easy improvements. So there's some basics that if we're not kind of doing these five basic things, um, then really we're, we're going to have trouble even getting out of the gate. So we have to at least get to the table stakes of those. And then the third thing is um, creating a customer quality metric. So this has evolved over the years. Um, it started up as a uh, science project back in Nortel Avaya 20 years ago and kind of evolved into um, a real... Um, statistical way we can show how our releases are performing in the field. So I'll, sh I'll share with you how, how I do that. Uh, a few years ago, uh, they had a, a quality problem and they couldn't figure out why customers are reporting different things at different times. And as we explored, it was a SaaS-based company, so you'd think they'd all be on the same release, but they're not. They were all in different releases running different custom code and different custom databases. So as soon as we standardized that, that actually cut out about 20% of our issues coming in just by standardizing customers. So there's some real basic stuff that you can do. You know, you're lucky if you're running a, a web app that you can push, you know, uh, updates to customers often. Keep doing that, like keep them all updated, force them to update, you know, keep them all at the, at the same level because as a QA organization, you just can't popcorn around to 100 different releases. Um, so let, let's jump in here. So uh, what features are customers using? What are they actually doing? What are the common configurations? What releases are they running? What's the attrition data? So attrition data is why are customers leaving us? So as QA, you should know why customers are leaving you. If they're leaving for product issues, you should know that because that'll factor into, especially exploratory testing and some of the edge cases that you do. So um, I have a bit of an example. Uh, you know, Quite a while ways back, we were doing a, a router. Uh, 
just a, a, an edge router in the Bell South network. And we had nothing but problems. Uh, you know, tough, tough meetings with the customer. We were doing everything. We were automating tests. We were, you know, setting up labs. We did everything. And then we realized we needed to get some telemetry. And telemetry is key. So if you're running a SaaS uh, business, you should have telemetry on what features customers are using because you know it's the 80-20 rule. Like 80% of your customers are using 20% of your features. And you just need to know what those 20% are and make sure those are 1,000% solid. And then the other 80%, you can, you can fill in a little less rigorously. So uh, for, uh, in this time, we, um, we went through and we realized they were only using about 10% of, of our code base. So we just pumped up the testing on the 10% of the code base, did another release, and they were extremely happy. We had five nines reliability. But um, you know, really, the product as a whole probably wasn't that much more forward advancing, but we actually just narrowed in on what the customers were looking for. So, so that was just an interesting learning uh, from way back. Um, and really, the other thing is, what does customer support think? So, so customer support tends to be very opinionated. And you know, as QA, we're the first customers of our product. but um, customer support's the second because they got to support whatever we give them. And in my current role, I actually um, run QA, customer support, and professional services and sales engineering. So whatever I get out of QA, I've got to eat it on the back end with the customer. So I, I definitely like customer support and QA to be really tied together. So it's, you know, this is anecdotal and it, and it may not, it may not guide you too much, but it really should, it really should be something that you do. You've got to be the collaborator. So QA people have to be the glue that sticks the organization together. If you're not a good collaborator, it's going to be tough to lead your QA team because we're influencers, we're collaborators. We we don't often get to make a lot of decisions. We don't get to decide what we're going to build. Product does that. Don't get to decide how to build it. Dev does that. We can decide how to test it. We don't get to decide how to support it because support does that. So we really have to influence all these all these uh, entities to make sure that it's supportable, you know, it's operational, it you know, feels good, the UI is good. Um, and, and so we can only influence. It, it's difficult to own. So I think that that's the hardest part about being a QA leader is having to influence um, all those around you. And then, and then we're really responsible for measuring. So if, if I took this example uh, from a SaaS uh, business I worked in a, a few years ago, um, I said, okay, after every build goes out, let's take a look. So the, the dark red ones are bugs that came in from customer. So those are field, field bugs against that release. And the red ones are the ones my QA team found. So while we were doing patches, so each one of these releases might have had a couple of patches in it, or, or maybe 10, who knows, right? Um, what happened? And you can see here, we put a UI refresh out, and it, it blew up, right? Because UI is very finicky. And, and uh, you know there can be problems with it. So you can see where we actually had to put some investment in internally to drive those numbers down. Um, so it kind of gives your uh, leadership an idea of are you, as a whole, are you driving in the right direction? You're gonna have a release that might come out a bit bumpy. It does happen, right? But you, know, you have to be able to kind of show that you're, you are narrowing down on where your issues are. Uh, so uh, second part of, of uh, you know, examine everything is look at the product itself. So sit down with your product management owner. Ask them where the product's going. Ask them what their biggest fears are. Ask them you know, what customers are telling them because they tend to get to go see the customers more maybe than we do in the QA seat. So ask where we're going because we've got lab build outs. We've got you know, scalability maybe concerns. We've got things coming up. And if you wait for the dev team to actually be coding it up, it's going to be too late for you to react. So you really need to have constant touch points with 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 the other leaders, and and you know and then you can measure when you're looking at the product. Measure performance. So filtration rate is huge, and a filtration rate is basically the number of bugs you get from the field. Bug stories, issues, customer doesn't like it. Doesn't matter. Any issue you get from the field, whatever has to filter to development to be fixed by code is is your filtration rate. So you know I've worked at companies where the worst in class. 15% of issues from the field actually had to go to the development team. And we figured out that they had just turned off logging and turned off a bunch of stuff. So the product, even though it was SaaS-based product, it was unsupportable. Um, and then I've worked at best-in-class companies where it's 0.2%. So only you know, uh, two out of every thousand issues we got from the field actually had to go to development. And that's really what you want. You want that filtration rate to be really low because you don't want to distract the development or your own QA team on having to repro customer issues, get them tested, get them fixed. You've got to um, drive down that filtration rate so that you can uh, keep your development organization and yourselves 
focused on moving forward and building new features. Nobody likes to go back and fix their old old junky code. Um, and you know, and then you really have to also, from a product review perspective, do all the normal QA things. We got to see, you know, how much is automated, how much is manual test. You know, is the pyramid looking more like an hourglass? You know, is, is something happening a bit funny, and is that okay? Do we have API test capabilities? All of those things. And so, when you're in a new in a new role, a new product, you've got to just figure out what do they have now. And um, and the quality trends again, um, it's more about interview your QA team because they know. They, they know even if they don't raise, sometimes they won't raise a bug because they go, uh, it's, nobody's going to address it or nobody thinks it's a big idea, a big deal or, or you know, I just don't want to get in a fight with Dev again about raising this issue because it's not worth it. But, you know, you as the leader can interview them and you can make notes of them and then when you're in your leadership meetings, you can push the organization gently to, uh, to make sure that we can raise those and we can fix those. Uh, some organizations are really good and you can raise everything and if you work in one of those, lucky you. But if, if not, then you have to figure out a way to influence to get everything addressed that you think should be. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a, um, a company I worked with a few years ago. And um, well, actually, it's 2017, 2018. So what we did is we looked at, um, we had some field problems. And, and, and it's really quite static. Uh, the, the number were going up a little bit. Choose This is JIRA. So this is filtration. This is what was the filtration rate was. This is what was actually raised with uh, with uh, Dev. And what we realized is that you know in twenty in twenty seventeen we were mostly raising orange, which was bugs. We were mostly raising bugs, and that was cool. You can raise bugs, um, but we noticed coming into the end of twenty eighteen we were getting more and more items raised as stories, which are feature requests. So we realized we were actually entering a new market with our product, and we had a gap. So we couldn't fill with our product the gap that we have. So this year in 2019, we're working to address that. Um, so, uh, but it was becoming hidden because lots of times these stories get turned into some feature request backlog that goes off until the end of time. And you know, you know, your product manager probably has a thousand things in their feature request backlog. But from a customer perspective, it was a bug. But from a product perspective, it's a it's a story or a feature. So, if you can highlight those and say it doesn't really matter what you call it, you still have to fix it or you still have to address it, um, I think it, it highlights that um, in terms of the customer. So QA should always be worried about those things that are coming in from the field and that are maybe feature gaps or, or supportability issues that we didn't think of because we didn't know that's where the product was going to go. Um, and then the third thing, uh, you know, in this, first, in this first area is to kind of review the organization. You know, what does your QA team think their job is? Do they think they're testers? Or do they think they're responsible for the quality of the organization and the product? And really, like, you know, some organizations we can put testers in the tester role, but that's not really what we want to do. We want people who are collaborators and people who will influence and people who will participate in design reviews and, and, and give good feedback. We, we don't want uh, testers, really. We, we want quality assurance. That's, that's what it is. Or whatever you want to call it, QE, quality engineering. Uh, you know, we want people to be... Um, uh, in, empowered to have those conversations. And that often requires you to, um, to influence your peers to make sure that that's known, that that's actually what their job is, is to influence it and influence um, what they do. So, you know, I, I do definitely, uh, this is one example of, uh, you know, what the QA role was at, uh, at Halogen, actually, when I worked there. I um, created this because it seemed as though, and, you know, we went into great detail on what with each of these went and, you know, each level of the tester and all those things, but really it was just to give actually the greater organization a view into what we thought QA should be doing for the organization and, and not just, we're not just testing. Um, so that, that's really key. And, and I think the other thing that um, you have to be really clear on, and, and I have heard others mention it since I've been here, is... Um, when you're setting up your own team, you have to think about the roles and responsibilities in your own team. And uh, I agree with the speaker this morning, Priyanka, that you can't have manual testers who automate on the side because it will never, ever, ever happen. Um, you know, even in my team, I have automation framework developers that don't actually write test cases. They just develop the framework for the automation. Then I have automation developers who develop the test case, and then I have manual testers. And the manual testers actually the lead manual tester is the product owner for automation. So they get to decide what gets automated. So um, that's, the, that's the way I set it up so that, you know, 
the things that are causing the manual testers that are the most repeatable, most boring, don't want to don't execute at every release, those get prioritized in more quickly than then you know the automation developers often want to go off and like explore this cool area of code and 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 they, they're not really helping me from business perspective. So um, you know I think keeping that loop and making sure your team's set up so that so that you can talk and it, it could be a really small team. My team right now is only six or seven QA testers. It's quite small, but they have distinct roles and they can float between, but for the most part we keep them pretty static. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, the manual testers are embedded in the Scrum teams. And when I have bigger teams, and I still try to do this now, is embed the automation developers in your Scrum teams too so that they know what's coming down the pipe. So as soon as it's at a quality that you can automate it, like, let's get it done. So, um, you know, it, it, it's really important to me that uh, people know what position they're playing on the soccer field. I would say, they're, you know, stop swarming the ball. Like, you're the automation person, you're the manual tester. Like, let's do it. And then we can cross-pollinate uh, later time kind of the first area uh, that, that I, I, um, I really do whenever I join an organization. Um, and the second things I do, and I've got five key differentiators, but they're, they're really not differentiators. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty basic, simple things that probably most of your organizations have, and maybe you're doing it with some degree of success or not, but if, if you're not doing it, then, then you're kind of, you know, you're missing the, the table stakes. So what, we'll get into those. Um, so, so they are code reviews. So you may not be writing the code or you may not be in development, but that code should be re getting reviewed and reviewed well. Um, code coverage. There's some really cool new things coming out with code coverage I'd like to talk about a bit. Automated regression, uh, defect escape analysis, really key, and uh, exploratory testing. So all of these things are simple, quicker to automate, quicker, sorry, quicker to implement, but um, really give you actually short-term payoffs uh, very quickly. So if we get into the code review, so we know that code quality and the structural code, you know, conformance to standards, whatever your coding standards are at your company, um, and the unit tests are generally a dev responsibility. Generally, that's that's where they play. Uh, you know, down here is more uh, where QA pay, pay, plays, um, you know, system tests, automated tests. Um, but if you look at the whole Scrum team generally owns everything up to the functional, right? Um, and sometimes Scrum team can own it all, that's fine too. Um, but you have to think that QA is part of that Scrum team, so we're part of owning the code quality. And, and um, you know, a lot of my QA team does participate in the code reviews. Um, and, and I think it's, the real thing here is that it's okay to go through the motions of code review, but they, it actually has to be like what I call a real code review, where you actually, you don't just throw it to your buddy across the aisle Say, did you review that? Yeah, yeah, it's good. You know, back like that's not really a code review. And um, the other thing we include in code reviews is unit tests. So we actually do code review on the unit tests because we have right now, I think, in some most all the new areas of code, we have close to 100% coverage in unit tests. But we can still see breakages in the product because the unit test was basically used. So. Um, and it's because sometimes it's implemented by somebody who doesn't really understand what they're doing. They haven't done them or they're a junior or whatever. So um, I would encourage, you know, the QA team to get involved in reviewing the unit test. And then that also helps us know, okay, so we know this area is 100% unit test coverage and it's pretty good. And some of those are actually getting really close to functional because the, you know, the unit test breadth was so, so, uh, so good. So we can kind of narrow down what we need to do from a full stack or an API test. Well, API tests are usually pretty straightforward, so you can test everything. But you know, full stack, um, you kind of can narrow down that based on the unit plus the API. What do I really need to full stack? Because those are expensive, they're less reliable, and you don't want to spend too much time on them. Uh, the second thing is code coverage. So actually, um, code coverage is kind of an old school thing. We're used to use CodeCov, and you know, we check our C code, make sure we had good coverage. Um, and now there's some really interesting new tools. I'm, I'm evaluating one right now called C lights and it actually does full stack. So it'll do everything from, from it'll look at what you tested manually, what you tested full stack automated API and unit and come up with a, this is how much of your code you're actually covering, which I, I find it really interesting. So you can find where the hotspots are that you're covering and where you're not. So um, this kind of went away as a thing, but it's coming back. And I think we should be aware of it in QA that, that you know, we should know what our code coverage is. And I mean, for our, our new products, obviously we're, we're, we're targeting close to 100%. It, it's difficult to get to 100% or it doesn't even make sense all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, 
it's 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 uh, it's it's pretty important that, that you know where it's covered, and then you can marry that up with that analysis you did in the beginning of which features your customers are using, and that's where you can target putting investment in. Uh, the third thing, test automation. So, um, you know, just saying I'm going to write a bunch of scripts and automating hasn't really worked well for me in the past. So the last uh, couple places I've been, we've actually created a, a an automation framework ourselves. You can use. Uh, frameworks that are available. Um, some some uh, areas are so customized. Right now, the, the products that I'm uh, t testing from an automation perspective have to have soft phones. So we have you know six different varieties of soft phones. We've got browsers. We've got different CRMs. And so um, if there if it's not built on a solid framework that has parallelization, has a retry on failure, and some other uh, really key items um, in a finite state machine, it just would not run because sometimes the phones go down, sometimes things happen. So, you know, from our automation framework, what we do is we store everything in test rails. So we actually go out, we reach out to our repo, we grab all of our automated tests for today, ones that are there. So if a new one got put in this morning, we grab that one too. It automatically gets populated into test rail. We use the test rail API, which is really cool. And we can grab, we say, give me a test that's not run yet. So it gives me a test, says run this one. So VM number one, I take it. Jenkins is our schedule, so, so it, it, it's scheduling us. I take I take it, and the VM will run test number one on VM number one, or whatever it ends up landing. And you know, at the same time, I've got you know 10, 12 VMs, however many I've got going that day, and I'll I'll run the tests. And so they'll round robin. They'll they'll just use any random VM, so that if we have one that tends to go down, or the soft phones went south because soft phones tend to not be as solid as we'd like them to be. Um, that that uh, test will only will try three times on three different VMs. So we'll ha we have statistics, so we know which which uh, environments are performing better than others, which tests are performing better than others, and we have you know we can put tests in the maintenance that are that continually fail, uh, things like that. So um, it's a good way to to automate your your tests um, in a really reliable way, so that so that customer or so that your your QA guys aren't spending their whole day um, reviewing failed tests because that's like the death of automation is if they come in and they've got 500 tests that didn't work last night, you know, that's what they're going to do all week and they're not going to develop anything new. So you have to really have a framework that's going to pass 90, like we're, we, we strive, strive for 100%, we're kind of at 99.98, 98.89, somewhere in there, 98.9, .9, somewhere in there anyway, depends on the day. But uh, yeah, we don't want to be reviewing more than five or 10. And if, if they flake out more than three days in a row, I put them in maintenance and uh, we, we actually have our co-op students get to look at those. So. That's how, that's how we manage those. Um, the other thing that, that you should do as well with your automation is make sure it's abstracted. So, you know, uh, wrap everything so that you can actually slip, switch out your browser, switch out your, your um, you can switch out your tools at any time. So we, we have everything uh, wrapped. Um, and I think I have kind of, uh, a sample of, of the build testing stages. So you should be influencing your team and you should be setting this up so that um, once the software is committed, uh, we have, uh, you know, static code analysis unit tests, uh, you know, database service tests. So those are kind of like the API tests. And then you have a smoke. And then you shouldn't, as a QA organization, likely, or if you know if you're doing AB, that's great. You shouldn't push to anything real until after your smoke's good. Um, you know, make sure that the thing actually installs and is alive uh, on your web page. We we used to do it here. And then we had a problem where Chrome broke us, so now we, we do it here. Um, so we can push to, uh, sometimes we'll push, uh, if we're feeling really confident, we'll push to beta right away, but this is this is the build that we take into uh, automation. We target about 70% full stack automation of our automated, of our manual backlog, uh, just because in the industry I'm in right now, I'd love it to be 80 or 90%, but because it's a telephony uh, case, uh, a lot of these complex telephony platforms don't lend themselves well to uh, doing that. Which ones? Oh, lo load and capacity. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so this is where we would do any kind of. Uh, we'll load up Salesforce with five hundred thousand users or hundred thousand users and see if our licensing system will license them all or unlicense them all. Um, things like that. Um, uh, and then we do a nightly run. We try to keep it under eight hours. Um, so the tests, the tests are mostly self-contained. Well, they're all self-contained. We target again the two-minute uh, timeline as well, but some of them with the telephony end up being four or five, and it's it's just a factor of, of the way uh, the way those run. 
Um, and then we do new feature test operational. And you know, when we, before we started this framework, it was four to six week regression cycle, if you can believe it, at the end of every uh, at the end of every uh, major release. And we're we're down to one to two weeks now. So it's been about eighteen months. It, it, it's slower than you think. And you have to really, you know, when you're implementing a new automation system, I think you know, trying to get return in a year is is a good time frame. Um, I think if your management thinks, oh, I hired an automation guy, you know, in three months from now, everything's going to be fine and I'm going to release faster, it's wrong, right? So I think setting those expectations, like this is not, you know, creating a new automation framework or even bringing an off the shelf one and integrating it into your product is not a three month endeavor. It, it always takes six months to get it off the ground. And then once it's off the ground, you actually have to automate some tests. So, you know, in terms of ROI, your leadership should kind of expect within a year they should get some ROI. But, you know, setting those expectations up front is a really good idea so that you're not under the gun after three months. How come, how come my world's not better? And, it, you know, it, it takes time. So that, that's my, uh, my big learning there. <laughs> I definitely got fell into that pit. Um, I think this is number four, defect escape analysis. So every time you have a customer issue come in from the field and it makes it to you and your development team, you should analyze it. Um, so I, I use a trap method, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of root cause analysis you do. Trap is trigger recovery architecture slash analysis and prevention. So you, can, you, you basically ask your QA team to go reach one of those bugs that got fixed um, you know, work with the developer who fixed it and kind of come up with what, why did this happen. And, you know, and the really key thing and recommended process improvements, the, the real thing is process. Did you have to t add a test case? Did you have to take one away? And, you know, if, if, you're, if your defect escape analysis ends up being, oh, yeah, we added a test every time, they're not doing a good job because they probably didn't modify it. We didn't prioritize those tests properly. There, you know, there's usually a lot more at play. And so once you get a few months worth of data, you can start to see where you have gaps. So it's a, it's a really helpful for driving quality um, to, to go through this process. And I have another slide as well just for you to take home with a little bit more information. Um, and I think this is the last area in this section, um, exploratory testing. So I'm sure you all do it. And, and everybody loves exploratory testing. Uh, we've made it into kind of an event at my current uh, job at Ingenious. So we actually plan a full day or sometimes two days. We bring in customer support. We bring in um, solution developers. We bring in QA obviously leads it, um, and we bring in uh, sometimes sales, sometimes sales engineering. We bring in a cross cut out of the company, and uh, we give people um, personas. So you know you're you're an agent at a uh, at a travel company, and you have to take you have to make inbound calls. You're, you have to make outbound calls. You're 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 level one support, and you're having troubles. You know going up to level two, and, and all of these things. Uh, so we give them all personas, and then we sit across a functional group in a room together. Uh, with, a, with a plan and a task that they have planned, you know, a, a sub subset of what browsers they're going to use so we get kind of coverage across the board. And we actually have them sit down in a room together for a day and, um, and, and bash at it and, and pretend they're customers. And, um, you know, in our last few regression cycles, we've raised actually 40% of our bugs in those two days versus the whole week or two that QA was, QA was doing it. So it's a really great way to kick off your regression cycle because... Um, now, we're doing exploratory all the time, and I'm not saying we're not, but to make it an event is, is really uh, fun for the company, too, and it gives the company an idea of what QA is doing, and um, it gives QA an idea of what, what does customer care see or what does customer support team see every day. So and it gives them a chance to also give, build their confidence, like QA knows what they're doing. Wow, these guys are, you know, they're testing, and, and so um, it actually just builds a lot of collaboration, so you end up not having that us and them, uh, us and them thing with the support team versus yourselves. Um, and then it's really important, and, and we do this uh, once a month actually uh, in my teams, but retro it. Retro everything. You know, if there's one tenant I love of agile software development, it's retros because that's where you get a chance to learn. And as a leader, you know, you get a chance to get the actions and, and, and really drive improvements. So um, you know, I think our number one was that we should have had ice cream on this one, but uh, <laughs> maybe... Maybe we uh, maybe we could do better. And, and you know, when we set people up with time zone, that we, we book rooms, you know, we make it kind of a really official day. And, um, you know, this has been one of the funnest things that we've implemented at, at Ingenious, and, and we're really happy with it. We're going to do one in uh, just a couple weeks. Part of my presentation is, um, so now I've done, you know, a bunch of analysis. I've got my QA team situated. They know what their job is. Everyone else in the company is behind them because they know what they know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I know what my product, where my product's going. I've, I've implemented some pretty 
simple but key things to improve the quality. You know, biggest non-simple thing is I'm automating the regression and it's solid. Um, so now how do I go back to my CEO and tell her, yeah, I think we're getting better. Um, you know, it, it can be anecdotal because, you know, sometimes it only takes one customer to give your CEO call and go, ah, this isn't working right, and all that effort that you've spent goes down the tube. So you want to you want to make sure that you have the, the data to prove that you are getting better. There we go. So uh, basically, we're going to measure uh, the problems the customers give us with our filtration rate, and we're going to um, plot that and see how our release is going. So um, often, we still document things that aren't um, problems, so aren't, aren't software issues. So we, we we do add usability. You know, anything anything that the customer reports to you that they think is a defect is a defect. It doesn't matter if, you know, dev says it's working as designed. It doesn't really matter. Like your customer, if they think it's not usable or it doesn't work or it you know, has a big gap, that, that'll factor into your quality metric because that's the overall perceived quality. So we're not calling out defects. We're calling out quality and, and the way the experience with the customer. So um, these are kind of the three tenets of that, right? Real product defects. Uh, customer found issues that could or could not be defects. And then their happiness. So you probably, uh, your, your company probably runs an NPS survey or maybe you run case surveys uh, after, your, after your, um, your support team does a case. Uh, we, we do NPS. We, we track this separately in, in the company I'm in now. So I, I haven't really uh, added that in here. Um, I decided on, for now, I'm focusing on internal beta and customer found defects. And then these are customer defects and non-defects. So what usability, what, whatever else. So um, if I looked at some of the releases we had, and, and actually these are uh, f fictionalized numbers. I, I'm not giving you our real numbers. But uh, um, if, if, if we look at, let's say, the last three releases, you know, these were the defects raised uh, by the, there was a total number of cases that went into the customer support team. This is how many JIRAs that went to the dev team. So this was my filtration rate. And then the real key is how many issues were raised by per customer. And that's really key because as you try to scale your business, if you have 100 customers and you're only getting 0.5 per customer, that's fine. You're getting 50, 50 real problems. But if you have 5,000 customers and you know 10,000 customers and you still have the same rate, you're you're going to be overrun and you're never going to get anywhere. So that's why driving this number down per customer is actually how you can show um, how you're improving. Um, you know, I've done it where you measure the customer quality metrics at maybe one month post-release, three months post-release, six months post-release. It's hard, right? Because you, you're on your business, you don't know unless you're SaaS-based and you're pushing out, you won't know how many how many customers are actually running your releases. So it's really dependent. So when I'm at a SaaS-based business and I know I have licensing months on it, so I know I have a user base of ten thousand and I've had uh, you know three months on it. I know I've got thirty thousand months on that. And that's easier to manage, uh, you know. So it really is dependent on what your business is as to what your denominator is going to be. You have to figure that out kind of for yourself, and depending on how much data you have, um, yeah. So I, sometimes it's licensing months. Sometimes it's just okay. Well, we put it out this this date, and we know we have twelve percent of our customers running on it at, at month three. So we'll we'll track that. So it's just try to make it repeatable. So here we'll come up with. Uh, with an example here, um, so uh, this is this is the last uh, about it's about three years worth of data uh, of major releases. So uh, the patches kind of combined in there. So you can see that uh, back in release two and three, we were struggling. So we have customer reported defects are here, and the number of licensing months are here. So uh, you can see that. These are older releases, so they've been around longer, so they've got l more licensing months, but their defect rate is really quite high in, in these three. So we realized around them we've got to do something. And when it really came to a head was when this release came back. It had just gotten installed, brand new, bad defect rate. We, you know, we, we, can't, we can't maintain that. So that's when we decided, okay, we better start some automation tests. We better start better exploratory. We've got to do some you know, uh, defect escape analysis and figure out what's happening. And then we were able to drive a little bit better um, and then a lot better uh, in release five, right? So, uh, and now release six is only just out and we're, we're, we're hovering down here. We're feeling pretty good about that. 
but it's got a ways to go before it's got some more legs on it to make sure. But generally in the first one to three months of your install, you will have like 80 to 90% of the, of the real issues that are gonna come in. Um, so that's, that's why we use this, um, this uh, uh, matrixy. It also helps guide investment. So it helps you push investment. If you know, if you can say each one of these is just a dot on a chart, but you have all the reasons why. You know why that dot's there on the chart or why it's up here. And so you can actually push for investment in different areas and help you prioritize because we only have so much uh, to give, really. So uh, you have to kind of prioritize your investment. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that is how um, I've been driving uh, in the last few years in terms of measuring whether what I've implemented is actually helping my business. And um, it, it does resonate at, at the boardroom. So, so that's, that's it. That's, um, that's all I've learned in the last probably 10 years of uh, trying to lead QA teams and trying to get them going. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions or um, just let you know.